Welcome to International Relations Lectures. So in chapter two, you looked at Thomas Hobbes uh, and basically looked at the history of medieval and modern Europe. And last lesson, in the last lesson, we looked at various videos, right? One was on the Magna Carta, some were on the wars in England, and uh, you also looked at the Protestant Reformation. So why did we do these things? Why did we look at these videos? So basically these videos look at the history of Europe, which you read about in chapter two, but they sort of, you know, give you this background a little bit, you know, it's interesting, but they have implications for international relations theory as well. If you look at the history of England, look at the Magna Carta, Henry VIII, American Revolution, you see that within England itself, you did not have central centralization of power. You had a power struggle between the lords and the monarchs at different times. And basically in the Magna Carta, the lords are pushing back at the monarch for taxing them too much and for imprisoning them. And so this power struggle ends in the 1500s and 1600s when Henry VIII and Elizabeth I basically demand that the lords give up their armies to the monarchy. And the lords at this time, why should they be convinced to do this? They have a lot of land, they have a lot of the military, but they decide to do so because they're enticed with this new plan called colonialism. Essentially, Henry VIII and Elizabeth, uh, Elizabeth I are trying to tell the lords, hey, invest in this new project we're doing. It's the colonial project. Basically, we're colonizing parts of America and later we'll colonize other parts. Of course, they are not involved in the colonization of Africa and Asia yet, but they're saying we need people to invest in this project and in return, you will get land in the new worlds, right? So this actually gets all kinds of people to invest in the colonial project. And slowly you see that the monarchy is getting richer and the lords are basically liquidating their properties in England, right? So in this way, we see power struggle and centralization of power in England within the state. The English civil wars, but are also useful for understanding how states function in the international system. So Hobbes is writing about the English civil war and that's how many of us find out about what's happening at that time. We know that millions die and next time England faces a major war like this is World War I. So Hobbes is very upset because society as he knows it is being destroyed, right? This is his life, his neighbors, his, you know, a way of living or livelihood, all of it is coming under attack. And he's very, very distressed about it. And he realizes none of this would happen if only people would support the government, right? They would support the monarch who is in power. None of this would happen, but it happens because the monarch is essentially unpopular at this time because he is Catholic and the Protestant Reformation has taken place in Europe and the parliament is basically Protestant. So his prescription is that if you want a stable state, you want law and order, then you really just have to sacrifice your individual uh, selfish interests. And so the implications in the international level is if you want to have peace, you need to recognize that 
we're all better off if there's no war, right? And so he's, the implication is that wars happen because we don't have a sovereign in the international system. We don't have a government at the international system. So there's no law and order, right? And we call this situation anarchy. And what we notice is that states are just like these power seeking humans. There are going to be some that want more power. So they will go into war when they see fit. But we also know this through the Treaty of Westphalia and later through the Concert of Europe that states also use diplomacy to end war. So for a period of time, the states, you know, Treaty of Westphalia, states are deciding that they're going to respect each other's borders. The same with the Concert of Europe. This happens after Napoleon Bonaparte's defeat, right? In 1815, the Concert of Europe is created. And when the balance of power system through the Concert of Europe fails, then they will try to create alliances. So we learn that there's a competition for power. States are self-seeking or think about their own interest. And states will even colonize other states if they get benefits, right? We see this with colonialism. Let's look at the concept of Europe. So really the concept of Europe is created when Napoleon is defeated in 1815, right? So Napoleon comes to power and over a short time, he tries to do all kinds of things to increase the power of France. Attacks Prussia, attacks Russia, attacks Spain, but all at the same time. And because of the alliance between England and Spain, England is forced to join the uh, war. And then, you know, Napoleon's forces are basically decimated, trying to go through Russia, but now also attacked by England. So they're defeated. So nations need to address the French aggression. And they engage in diplomacy. They sit down and they decide that they're going to engage in a peace, you know, treaty. So the Congress of Vienna leaves Europe with stable borders and a few powerful nations. You have Austria, Britain, France, Prussia, and Russia, right? So no wars will happen among these major powers until the Crimean War. And later we see more wars will happen once Italy and Germany become independent. So previously you saw with the Protestant Reformation that Germany is essentially the Holy Roman Empire and then it becomes Prussia and basically it's 37 parts. And in 1871, Germany is unified. First thing Germany does is attack France pay back four centuries of attacks, right? So it takes back Alsace, Alsace and Lorraine. So the concept of Europe need to give Germany some colonies in Africa, basically to appease Germany because suddenly it's become a very important power. World War I happens because alliances are dragged into war, right? So you see that Germany supports Austro, Hungary attack against Serbia, but now because of alliances, Germany is forced into the war and then others like, you know, the U UK, basically Great Britain and Russia are right to war as well. Ultimately, France takes back Alsace and Lorraine and also Rhineland from Germany at the end of World War I. And World War I essentially is about Germany and Italy looking at the rest of Europe and saying, well, all these countries have colonized Africa and Asia and we want that land as well, right? And so World War II happens because Germany is unhappy about concessions to France. 
after World War I. And they also lost land, right? So now they're really unhappy. And technological developments have happened in Germany and US, and they surpassed the rest of Europe. So now Germany is ready to attack, right? So all of this leads to World War II. Let's stop in this uh, for this video and come back and talk about other things later.